It's really an honor to be here today on this momentous occasion and to share what we've learned and to review the results from our first in human clinical trial on laser assisted filter removal. Just a few brief disclosures and as well just a reminder with regards to off-label use, the permanent type filters that we attempted to retrieve were not designed, intended, or FDA cleared for removal. Well, as has been mentioned many times, by now we're all well aware of the potential risks from an indwelling filter. These include thrombotic complications, the potential for perforation with injury, fractures, embolizations, as well as the potential need for ongoing anticoagulation. And collectively, this can generate a great deal of anxiety not just among patients, but also with providers. And so the original purpose of our study was to look at the safety and the e efficacy of the eczema laser sheath specifically for removing embedded filters that were refractory to standard methods and high force. This was a prospective single center study running over eight and a half years. During that time, more than 2,500 advanced filter retrieval attempts were made at Stanford. And from that group, 500 consecutive patients who met criteria were enrolled to undergo attempted laser-assisted filter removal. A small handful of patients were excluded from this trial for the reasons that are listed here. And these were the demographics of our study population. All the data were captured in a HIPAA-compliant e-database. As mentioned, all these filters were refractory to standard retrieval methods with high force. Now, what does that mean? It means several pounds of tension had already been applied and failed in the retrieval. That's 3x the standard retrieval force. There were actually three groups of retrieval indications that were identified in our trial as used as criteria. Number one were the symptomatic patients. It's pretty obvious why we would want to remove the filter in these patients who are already suffering from filter-related morbidity. But we also identified a great number of patients who were asymptomatic, and so the indication was actually prophylactic to remove the long-term risks that we know are associated with the exposure to a prolonged filter implant. And just as interesting was a third group of indications, those who actually came to us already on filter-related anticoagulation. And so we wanted to remove this device, the filter, and potentially eliminate their need for ongoing anticoagulation. The apparatus that we used was the original CVX-300, xenon chloride laser generator, that was powering a laser tip sheath calibrated to 60 millijoules per square millimeter. And very early in our trial, we introduced this concept of digital force assessments in order to try to improve safety. We actually hypothesized that the laser assisted technique with the force gauge use would allow removal of over 95% of embedded filters and using a lower amount of force and with a safety margin that was less than 5% risk of major complications. So our primary outcomes were successful retrieval and our primary safety outcome was any major complication as defined by the SIR's guidelines. And now results laser assisted removal was successful in over 99% and that was significantly greater than our 95% threshold. The mean filter dwell time was over four years and the longest exceeded 27 years. The mean post laser force was significantly lower than the pre-laser force. And this means that not only were we able to remove these devices, but we could do it using lower force, a less, much less traumatic removal experience. These were the variety of filters that were encountered in our trial, 11 different filter types. You can see the retrievables along the top, as well as removables along the bottom tier. In the mean dwell times, you can see the wide range, and these are dwell times extending into the decades. Major complications were encountered in 2%, which was significantly lower than 5% threshold. And this table breaks it down. 10 different complications were encountered throughout the trial. And for us, it's more a reflection of the type of patients that we agreed to accept, very complex, complex cases that we agreed to accept. And if you break down the etiology, only three of these were actually attributed to laser activation, either along an embedded apex or along conical or cylindrical filter fracture components. Fortunately, all 10 of these were successfully managed percutaneously and or with medical therapy. And so there were no patients who required any open surgery for the management of their complication. Now we talk about the risk to benefit ratio when we're trying to treat patients. All 10 of these patients had been suffering from filter related morbidity and it was all alleviated after removing the filter. We had three retrieval failures all associated with this filter type along with chronic cable thrombosis. And the presence of that when you have calcified thrombus within the filter 
um, we notice that that is the limitation, uh, the main Achilles, if you will, of the laser sheath as in its current status. Even the largest sizes may be too small for some of these. Now, fortunately, in that case, we were able still to achieve revascularization by stenting through the filter as our second choice in order to alleviate the symptoms. But more commonly, you would see a conical device that could also result in chronic cable occlusion, and this time you have aortic penetration. Now, you would never want to stent this filter permanently in place, and so after confirming that it was refractory to several pounds of tension, we activated our laser and were able to explant this device using lower force, a more gentle removal experience. And that patient also went on to have full revascularization to alleviate their venous obstructive symptoms. <coughs> Among 133 symptomatic patients who were suffering from filter-related morbidity, successful retrieval resulted in immediate symptom improvement in over 99%. And speaking of anticoagulation, the retrieval allowed discontinuation eventually of anticoagulation in over 98%. And that's a big deal for these patients for three reasons. Number one, it spares them the cost of taking anticoagulation. Number two, the inconvenience of remembering to take it. And perhaps the most important, number three, the bleeding risk associated with lifelong anticoagulation. <clears throat> now that we have these tools available to offer advanced filter removal, we actually find ourselves asking some important questions. What is an acceptable risk to benefit ratio for attempting filter removal, in particular advanced filter retrieval? Despite encountering more and more challenging cases, can we make the advanced retrieval techniques and protocols safer? And if so, who are the best candidates to undergo filter removal? It's such a timely discussion, not just in the subspecialty of IR and image guided therapy, but if you think about the general medical community, this was the featured clinical decisions making piece earlier this month in the New England Journal. The focus was on a case of a patient who presented with a 10 year old filter. And the big debate was what to do with that patient, how to manage that patient. What was the optimal risk to benefit ratio in that decision making? And not long ago, we ourselves published our SIR CPG guidelines, as has already been referenced before, but it bears mentioning again. The SIR suggests consideration of filter removal in patients who are suffering from filter-related complications, specifically after weighing the filter versus procedure-related risks. Again, it gets back to that concept of the risk-benefit ratio. In an earlier landmark study by Al Hakim and colleagues, they actually compared advanced versus routine retrieval attempts, and indeed they found advanced techniques were met with higher success, but there was a big trade-off, and that there was also a significantly higher major complication rate of over 5%. And if you go back and look at the data and you look at the injuries that were caused, um, by and large, most likely from excess force that was placed on the device as well as the vessel walls. And that was before there was any protocol uh, to allow force gauge assessments and before any eczema laser technique was widely available. And that's why we hypothesize that using an advanced laser assisted retrieval protocol with force gauge use that we could remove a greater number of percentage of filters with lower force and with less risk of major complications. And to that effect, we were able to achieve all three of our study endpoints in this trial. Laser technique safety in our minds, again, hinges upon making sure we don't overexert, that we only ablate when and where it's needed in order to reduce the risk of cable injury. And the eczema laser mechanism itself allows us to achieve very fine micron tissue ablation by harnessing the energy at 308 nanometer wavelength. The CVX300 actually adds just enough energy to disrupt organic molecular bonds and to dis disintegrate 50 micron tissue layers through this process known as photothermal ablation. Now, earlier on in the trial, you know, we weren't sure what this was going to be happening on a cellular level, and so we decided to study it histologically among the first 200 filter specimens that we explanted and placed under the microscope. And what we saw was actually fascinating. We actually showed safe photothermal ablation margins through filter hair and scar tissue in 98%. And this actually gave us the confidence to continue the trial going forward following that same protocol that I've described. Well, our study was mainly limited by the fact that the results were acquired over many years at a single center where we garnered a lot of experience using laser and using advanced techniques. And so the overall results may not always be representative. Um, but we did have identify some important contraindications. And these contraindications include just being unfamiliar with the laser technique or advanced removal in general. 
if you're able to capture the device using several pounds, six to seven specifically, um, then you do not want to be activating laser in that scenario. Against any chronic calcified thrombus, we've seen limitations with advancing the laser in its current form and its current size. And then finally, lacing along an embedded or impaled filter apex or along fractured components actually could lead to asymmetric lacing, which we've identified as a major risk factor for vessel injury. So in conclusion, laser tissue ablation has emerged as a viable option for removing embedded filters that are refractory to high force, but please beware of the contraindications. Successful filter removal in our trial, uh, we've seen often results in symptom improvement in those who are suffering from filter-related morbidity. And it can also help patients achieve cessation of filter-related anticoagulation. Um, for many more details of this study, here's the full reference. Thank you. Kush decided it's a tough act to follow. Um, a colleague, a mentor, and really the uh, the pioneer in this technique. <clears throat> I'm going to be presenting our data, but also I'm going to be presenting some complementary approaches. And really, one of those things is addressing the 2010 and 2014 safety communications from the FDA that really mandated that, not mandated, but pretty close to mandated from what the FDA can do, that we should be following our devices. And particularly given the fact that so many long dwelling devices are out there, we finally have something available um, that's been studied generally to, to approach these patients. And these are my disclosures. <clears throat> so we're going to talk before how, we're going to talk about why. Uh, we know about 2010 and 2014. In 2008, um, right around the time that there was a paper from the Northeast where we saw filter-related complications coming around, and that's probably what moved uh, everything forward in terms of the 2010 safety communication. We at the same time in Northwestern and uh, my mentor Bob Ryu re uh, realized that we had no organized effort to track filter patients. So in 2009, January 1st, probably January 2nd actually, he um, established an IBC filter clinic, much like what Will described too. And the idea was, is there a systematic way that we can actually follow these patients and improve retrieval rates? This is not about getting better at retrieval at that time, it's just about actually following patients. And we saw a very uh, a significant increase in uh, retrieval rates. In 2010, we noticed that our failed retrievals were 10%, and we were seeing more and more device-related complications. Like Will, we were getting outside referrals, and so then it was a matter of upping our game. Not just actually getting patients back, but can we be more successful in retrieving some of these more complex devices? This is the filter clinic paper. It's uh, one, uh, very heavily cited and just a very basic concept, right? If you follow the patients, you can bring back more. 469 patients uh, or, or retrieval filters placed between 2000 and 2010. 79 percent of those were preclinic, and 21 percent of those were postclinic. And I'll just point out here that we weren't actually at that point better at taking them out, but because we were getting patients back, our retrieval rates are higher. The critical first step was dedicated personnel, people devoted to monitoring these patients, and dedicating themselves to the art, the craft, and the practice. And we have an RN coordinator. She's my right hand. I mean, she is the central cog in all of this. Without her or an equivalent, it's just too difficult to do this. We're all very busy. Um, you need extenders. You need help in doing this. Uh, dedicated physicians, in, uh, one in the, the science of, of, of how to approach filters. Uh, and the clinical practice of advanced retrieval techniques, but also keeping up eventually public, publishing results as Will has and as we'll show you uh, our, our data as well. Um, we did a lot of prospective enrollment and then we went and looked back. Which of our filters did we miss? Some of those more prone to complications. Which can we get back? So there was a catch up. Um, a lot of internal messaging. Easier now that we have electronic medical record, a lot more email back then and just saying, look, listen, we are available to, to address these patients, so please refer them to us. If you have a filter problem, we'll figure it out for you. You don't need to figure it out. And then organic growth and external messaging, where we went from regional, like uh, Will, to a national and international uh, center of uh, referral. I want to approach the idea of dwell time, and dwell time is problematic from multiple perspectives. I'm sure Will's heard this, and many of you have heard this as well. That filter's been in too long. It's going to be dangerous to remove, and that has been promulgated throughout the literature. We're going to see uh, some of the papers that pointed this out. 
These are two. These are two examples of papers that have shown that a greater than ninety day dwell time was associated with filter failure. Now, this is before advanced retrieval techniques. This is just with standard sheath and standard technique. But clearly, the idea that a filter was in that a filter can be in too long to be not only unsafe to retrieve, but it's not going to be successful to retrieve it is is um, an age old paradigm. Then you have the idea of not only is a filter that's been in a very long time not going to be successfully removed, but it's also, as Will pointed out, subject to more device-related complications. And this was a systematic review by Dr. Kaufman and colleagues where they found that most reported events associated with filter-related complications were over 30 days in dwell time in uh, many years. And unfortunately, this has became a more and more common site where you had fractured devices, um, embed, uh, components embedded in the heart and the lungs that, are, um, that carry a risk of death. So what changed the game, and really that's where advanced techniques came in, and the eczema laser, as, as we've been talking about, is absolutely central to that, but there are other things, and you need to use frequently in these cases multiple techniques to get yourself in a position to retrieve it successfully. Once you have control of the filter apex, that's when the laser, is, as we'll just mention, that's when the laser comes into play. But if you don't have control of the filter apex, you cannot use a laser. So we'll talk about some of the techniques that you need to, to um, to uh, successfully retrieve these devices. This publication that we uh, published in 2015 was simply aimed at refuting the whole dwell time thing, that dwell time is not correlated with our ability to successfully retrieve filters. And this was 648 of our uh, retrieval procedures. We had a 97% retrieval rate, and we did a multivariable regression analysis. And what we found was that technical retrieval success was absolutely independent of filter dwell time, and adverse events were independent as well. And as, as you would expect, and has been shown in other, other centers' data, the longer that it's been in, the more likely that you're going to need to go to your bag of tricks, that you're going to need advanced retrieval techniques, and it's going to be beyond simple uh, share and, snare and sheath technique. We then went on to identify, at least from our center, what is that inflection point in time? When should the referrers think about, okay, my local expertise may not be great enough and we need to refer it to somebody that uh, does a lot of um, complex filter retrieval. And so the idea behind it, finding an inflection point was sort of born of that. And this is from 2009 to April of 2015. We used all of our prospectively acquired data and 762 retrieval procedures. We went back through the literature and this actually came out of a nephrology journal, a nephrology journal where we did a spline regression function analysis. And through some statistical trickery, which I'm not going to uh, pretend to completely understand, we found that at approximately seven months, if you only had standard sheath and snare available to you, you were going to fail 41% of the time, obviously unacceptably high. So this is, the, this is what we can go out to the community with at least a general number. Maybe it's not generalizable to all centers, but with a general number that around seven, eight months, start thinking about maybe referring out uh, your, your filters if you don't have local expertise to do complex filter retrieval. <clears throat> we then decided to publish a little bit about the actual techniques itself in a pictorial asset because everybody likes pictures. It's dry to read the, about this stuff, so we, in radiographics, we published we published our diagrams and schematics on how all these advanced retrieval techniques are aimed at sort of addressing different problems with, uh, with these devices in situ. The first is the loop bar technique. It's been well described, I think. We described it. Uh, the UCLA group decided it. You might have described it as well. I've, I've lost track at this point. But uh, different variations on this. And we've taken on the variation of not, in general, looping a wire, an exchange length uh, hydrophilic wire, through the filter, but instead targeting the cap. The reason why we don't go through the filter is that you can apply asymmetric force unless you are exactly orthogonal to the long axis of the filter and that the sheath is going to come over at exactly center parallel, you are, or not orthogonal, I'm sorry, parallel, then it's, then you're exerting asymmetric force and you're not going to sheath the filter. So the idea behind this was targeting the fiber and cap that so frequently embeds, embeds the apex of the filter against the cable wall, utilizing a reverse curve catheter, a hydrophilic wire, and a snare. You need at least a 12 French sheath and frequently as we've gone on in our experience, we're, we're going to larger sheets such as this, uh, the 16 French sheath. This is a schematic to just kind of pictorially represent what I'm talking about. Reverse curve catheter getting underneath that, um, that fiber and membrane, sending a looped wire through, and then snaring that side of it and then pulling on it. And many times the whole filter comes out with it um, if it hasn't been in that long. Uh, and, but frequently what also occurs is that you just release the cap. And then now the filter can be snared and you can apply other techniques as necessary. 
a couple videos here just to kind of show how this works. So you can see that I have this reverse curve catheter here and I'm not through the filter. Again, I'm just on that radiolucent apex. And then we snare a uh, exchange length hydrophilic wire and so you have both ends coming out of the sheath. And then we just put um, a hemostat on the back end to provide a traction platform. And finally, we send the whole we send the whole sheath down, and in this case, uh, we were able to get down to probably the mid portion of the filter, and then over that, we advanced the laser sheath to perform photothermal ablation. Forceps has become absolutely central to my to our practice. Um, the rigid arm bronchial forceps are provided by this company, Limewall 4162, although my understanding is that may, they may not be as widely available now, so we're looking at some alternatives uh, for potential forceps uh, because these do have a shelf life. The teeth actually wear out on them and you, you need to get new ones. So we're, we're trying to figure that out. Maybe we'll talk about that offline. But um, it, it, this similar to the loop wire technique, um, you target the embedded filter apex and actually the loop wire technique outside of maybe biconical filters has largely gone by the wayside, at least in my practice. I go to, I'm very comfortable with forceps. I go to that first in, in terms of capturing the filter apex. You need at least a 12 French sheet because the forceps will go through it, but frequently you're going to need a 16 French sheet because the problem is, is that when the forceps are on top of something and you have the jaws actually open and grabbing the apex or tissue, it's going to be too small to fit. The 12 French sheet is going to be too small to actually fill, uh, fit the device. Um, you, want to, you want to be very careful when using forceps. Um, patients can get very, very uncomfortable. If I anticipate extensive forceps use based on if, if I know I'm doing a complex procedure, um, these patients are under anesthesia, at least some sort of monitored anesthesia care um, while we're doing this. You don't want to just indiscriminately bite down when you're doing it. What I typically do is we hit the, the forceps are malleable, as you see here, and then we just take a clock face approach until you feel metal on metal, and then mentally note where on the clock face you are, and at that point start gently trying to come down on the filter as you see here. Another schematic, same idea, you're pulling that uh, fiber and membrane off and then working to capture the filter. So sometimes you're going to be, and this is a the technique to, uh, that was initially described by the Penn Group and they've, they've published a, a lot of their results on this. Um, what you <coughs> initially may do is just capture the apex, but in some cases you can't feel the metal. And so you're going to be just actually peeling a little bit of fiber off and you'll pull it, pull it out of the sheath and you'll see little bits of white material come off until you can feel that metal. And then once you do this and you can see that this device was fractured, we'll talk about that in just a second, um, we then use a, with the forceps having a firm grasp of this, we then take our sheath over it to, uh, to successfully retrieve this device. Very helpful for fractured fragments. Um, my personal approach is if I see a fractured fragment, um, and this is based on a couple things that occurred early on in our experience, I actually go after that first. I don't go after the filter first um, because manipulation of the filter, sometimes it requires you to torque the cave out a little bit. Um, you can actually dislodge that fragment and I've had to go and chase them out of the lung and that's not something I'd, I'd like to try and avoid that. So we take the fragment out first. And then the laser. And so you can see somebody's tried to retrieve this. The hook has been slightly straightened out. And so they probably, as, as Will mentioned with the force gauge, they probably pulled extensively and they couldn't release the filter. And these filters, at least in our experience, are the most likely to need the laser, which is that closed cell design, because that closed cell design has such an extensive surface area, uh, contact surface area with the cable wall. And so the, the rate of endothelialization or the, the exuberance of endothelialization is much greater uh, than uh, open cell devices. Of course, open cell devices do need laser as well uh, many times, but frequently with the closed cell devices is where we've noticed, and I'll show you our data in that regard. Just to give you an idea of how this is tethered, we, we took this picture early in our experience where we have, the, we have everything down, the laser's ready, we haven't quite activated it yet, and you can see exactly where it's attached where the pedals in this case are meeting with the primary struts and that's where you have all that zone of contact. And so this is where you just activate the laser while maintaining traction and it releases very quickly and then you successfully retrieve the device. In the interest of time, I won't go through this because we'll describe the technology beautifully. Um, it's a cold, the, the excellent laser is a cold laser photothermal ablation that uh, disrupts molecular bonds at the, at the site of the implant. I believe we have a new box coming that's going to be a 110, not a 220, which um, I should actually broaden the availability of this. Uh, our rooms ha have 220 volt outlets built into them because we ant anticipated needing them as our practice group, but uh, 
with the move to a 110 device, it'll be much, much more broadly available. Another schematic from the radiographics paper showing how this works, application of laser once you get to that point of, of resistance and then while maintaining traction, and it's important. This is actually something worth, worth specifically mentioning. Anytime you retrieve a filter, it doesn't matter what technique you're using, whether it's a sheath and snare, whether it's forceps or whether it's laser, you have to think about it mentally as two vectors. One vector is your sheath coming down, the other vector is your traction platform, and you want those arrows to cancel. If one arrow is too big, this way or this way, that's when you get cable and disception, cable ruptures, those kind of things. So you have to mentally think about pulling as hard as you're pushing, basically. And the laser allows you to pull and push less hard when you have a when you have an embedded device. And then just a, a quick video of how this is working. This is a, another closed cell device here, and we got down to that point where you, you have a lot of uh, surface area contact with the IBC and activate the laser to retrieve it. I like this picture because it shows you exactly where it's attached. Those little fibrin threads right where the pedals, in this case, meet the primary strut, and that's where the, these filters get stuck, and you can see that uh, somebody did try to pull on this. Onto the Northwestern data, uh, we published this in the Journal of American Heart Association 2020. This is 441 of our patients with filter implantation times over six months or prior failed retrieval attempts at outside institutions, and standard retrieval attempts, uh, attempts were uh, a standard, standard retrieval technique was attempted prior to escalation to advanced retrieval technique or if somebody else had documented failure of it. So for example, if somebody tried with the snare and I have a CT scan that shows that it's tilted and embedded in the wall, I'm not going to open a snare. I'm going to go to something else. Uh, I, I'm not going to try a standard technique there. And our hypothesis was that closed cell design filters were more frequently going to require laser sheath application for safe, safe and successful retrieval. Our overall technical success is 98%, 96% in laser cases. The laser sheath is required in 40% total, and much more frequently in closed cell designs uh, with a 20.1 odds ratio. That, that's just our observation. Um, there was no significant difference in dwell time between the open and closed cell, 54.4 months uh, mean, and 58.5 months in the, in the open cell devices. There were three total adverse events, one in the laser cohort, and that this is just going based off of SIR adverse uh, event criteria. This is a gentleman that had uh, a biconical filter. We had to access the groin. These are large sheaths, and he had a groin hematoma and spent a couple nights in the hospital as we sorted that out. So we concluded that if you think that you're going to need this device, and I don't know what it's like at Stanford or what it's like at any one of uh, your institutions, but we share this box with vascular surgery, EP, cardiothoracic surgery. and so. You want to plan ahead. These are elective cases, largely. And so you want to make sure that it's scheduled, the box is available, that you're not taking on a case that you have to bring the patient back, expose them to the additional risk of anesthesia and an additional procedure, and you puncture all of those things. So we have, have everything planned in advance. The box is in the room. The disposables are not open until we need them, but we have everything available uh, when, when, uh, when you're taking on these cases. So with that, I think we're going to move on to a case, and I believe you're going to go first. Sure. Thanks, Kush. That was that was great. And this is an opportunity now to, to review specific cases to talk more about the details, how we identify patients, what the indications are, what the potential risk may be, and how we use laser specifically. So this was a 66-year-old uh, male who presented with a Gunther Tulip filter. This had been placed 12 years prior. This is a prime example of a closed cell design, as Kush has mentioned. So right away when you hear that history, you think there's a high likelihood that this patient might benefit from laser tissue ablation. So he's now presenting with a four-year history of severe bilateral lower extremity pain, swelling, and he's got non-healing wounds, venous ulcers. Law to score is exceeding 30. He's also unable to exercise, not just because he has pain in his legs and swelling, but he also complains of severe dyspnea on exertion. A CTV shows some pretty classic findings, chronic ileal cable occlusion, and penetrating filter components. And again, an example of what can happen when a filter that was only supposed to be temporary was left in. So what are the indications for removal in this case? So ideally, we'd like to remove the thrombotic filter nidus along with the penetrating components, and that in turn would allow us to achieve full ileocable revascularization without jailing in the filter. 
If we're able to achieve this, then hopefully we could alleviate his severe PTS and promote his wounds to heal. And maybe we could restore his cardiac preload and his exercise tolerance. And on top of all that, there's a psychological component. And we see this time and time again. The patients themselves have taught us how to think about this, <clears throat> what it means for them to have a device that's been sitting there that's now penetrating, that has a whole constellation of findings. It actually generates a tremendous amount of anxiety in these patients. So the good news in this case is that the bilateral common femoral veins were open, and so we access those, and you can see from this initial venogram that there's chronic total occlusion of the infrarenal IVC as well as both iliacs, and there's reconstitution way up here of the suprarenal um, IVC right above the filter. Other findings that I've mentioned, there was leg penetration. And there was also the tip of this filter was, had scarred in, grown into the wall. So you have the full constellation of an end stage device that's been left in now for over a decade. And just as a reminder of the clinical sequelae, PTS, non-healing wounds, cardiopulmonary exercise intolerance, he essentially has no normal preload. He's got penetrating filter leg complications. He's got anxiety from having this filter in place. So um, these can now be done in a single session uh, under anesthesia. And now that we have eczema laser, we have the capability to achieve advanced removal along with full revascularization. And as a first step, we very carefully revascularize through the filter, making sure we don't pass through the interstices. And I did this fluoro save for a few reasons, but the main was to show, uh, if I can get this to play, if you notice this balloon inflating along a 12-year-old filter, you'll see where the web is. I mean, it's exactly where the filter is. And so it's no surprise how over time this device became a thrombogenic nidus. He would have no other reason to thrombose his IVC. I mean, there's no mass, there's no obstructing lesion, but there's a filter in place. And again, you can see the legs of this device penetrating out here, and the tip of this filter is firmly embedded. So now that we revascularize through to a limited extent to allow the insertion of certain devices, as Kush had mentioned, um, this is a, a go-to technique, the endobronchial forceps that we use. And again, you must use these very carefully and in the right location. <clears throat> these are very good for the embedded apex, embedded APCs. However, I've seen other operators use these on embedded struts, and they try to rip the filter out and... Oftentimes you can remove this device by ripping the filter out, but you can also cause a lot of complications. You know, it's already been mentioned in the earlier lecture that we've shown laser has the capability to remove filters using lower force. And what that means is a lower risk of traumatic vessel injury and filter fracture. If you, t if you think about forceps, on the other hand, forceps can generate extremely high amounts of force, and it has been associated with a higher risk of vessel injury as well as a higher risk of iatrogenic filter fracture. And if you take a look at the complications specifically of forceps versus laser, the forceps specific major complication rate is over 7%, which is actually over 12 times higher than the laser specific complication rate of 0.6%. In addition, forceps are also associated with an 18% iatrogenic fracture rate including filter fragment embolization into the heart and lungs. And as Dr. Desai already mentioned, you know, when you're dealing with filters, oftentimes they come to you and they're already broken or they're very brittle, and you can actually have embolizations even without doing anything, but just barely touching the, the fragment or the filter. Um, but you, you certainly don't want to introduce that risk by placing an excess amount of force on an old device. And just as a reminder, when we took a look at the breakdown in terms of laser, we had no such complications. We had no iatrogenic fractures or embolizations that were caused by the technique. And the reason why is we're very, very careful. Once we secure the apex, we actually go back to the ensnare, attach it to the digital meter, and here you see six and a half pounds have been applied and we're not unable to sheath the lower half of this device. Um, but now that we have laser, we can go to lower amounts of tension and let the eczema laser energy do its work. So the laser technique with the digital gauge allows successful removal at lower force in order to avoid major vessel injury. 
This is what happens in real time when we reach the distal aspect. And as Kush alluded to, you don't want to be pushing too hard or pulling too hard. You want to be really gentle here. You don't want to drive the tip of the laser sheet too far against the, the walls of the IVC, especially where not only the legs are embedded, but there's also quite often penetrating filter components. And so we actually instruct our trainees to be really mindful of the radiology and what we see on the CT beforehand and what you cannot see on the fluoro. On the live fluoro, um, quite often, you know, you have to predict where those penetrating components are and we'll actually place that reference image from the initial venogram which shows the penetration along with the CT scan just to make sure that once we get to the distal aspect we're going to hold the laser tip, the laser sheath stationary and we're going to go to half the amount of tension that it was refractory to and let the laser do its work. So let me play that one more time. If we can get that to play. Here we go. So here we are at three pounds. We're activating laser. If you take a, take a look, the laser sheath itself hardly moves. Uh, we let the penetrating components come back into the endoluminal side. And this cartoon illustrates it even better because it actually shows what happens, the pathophys of the fibrotic tissue that forms along the attachment sites. The tissue that you cannot see on the live fluoro, but that you can actually feel. You have the tactile sensation of something being tethered in place. And as I've said earlier, it's very common to have penetrating components. And so you have to be really mindful of where those are. And so once the device has been confirmed to be refractory to several pounds, it actually gives you the confidence that you have enough tissue there to safely ablate. And so here, after confirming several pounds of tension, um, we're unable to remove this device. Uh, we typically go at about half the amount of force. And we let the laser energy do its work. Again, being very mindful of where the penetrating components are. And since the energy of the laser sheath, the energy is emitted parallel to the vessel walls, the risk of significant vessel injury is also minimized. So once the adherent tissue is ablated, the distal filter legs, including the penetrating components, can now be retracted safely into the vessel lumen and captured within the laser sheath. And again, using a lower amount of force, it's much less traumatic the chronically embedded filter can be removed, safely detached from the IVC wall without injuring the underlying cava. Um, and as Kush showed in, in some beautiful examples um, of his explants, if you look really closely at a lot of these devices, you'll see tissue um, left over. And what does that look like under the microscope? Well, here's an H&E stain at 100x, and it actually shows focal areas of photothermal ablation. Now, remember the first time we submitted this to the pathologist. We didn't tell them what we, we had done. And they immediately called and said, you know, what, what, what happened to this tissue? We haven't seen anything like this. And that was actually the first sign that the energy itself was having an effect on that cellular level that we talked about. And then we got even more sophisticated with the staining and the recommendation of our pathology guys was to conduct EVG staining because this analysis also allowed us to not only detect that we could ablate tissue uh, or fibrotic tissue, but we actually use it as a way to identify if there were any cable elements because occasionally we would see cable wall elements, particularly with penetrating components, or in cases where before we had dialed in our protocol, maybe we shaved a little bit too much IVC tissue. So once the filter is out, especially a, a penetrating obstructing device like the one I've shown, we can move a lot more confidently with achieving full revascularization. And here you see an IVC stent that's been placed. Um, here we are just going about our full revascularization on both sides. And the end result is restoration of full iliocable flow in a patient who's been obstructed for many years. And what that means for the patient is we've alleviated his PTS, we've enabled him to heal his wounds, we've restored cardiac preload, restored his exercise tolerance, taken out the penetrating components, and overall, we've alleviated his anxiety. And so that's the, the power of laser in terms of being in a, in a portfolio and an armamentarium of, of equipment that we can use to help these patients. And we can now the, do all these cases in a single session, a single three to four hour session under anesthesia. Thank you.
that's a great case, Will, and uh, you know, doing these kinds of cases, I firmly agree that if you can retrieve the filter, there are some types you can't. Uh, I think biconical filters, particularly in cable occlusions, are difficult, yeah. but they're also more amenable to reconstructing through. Whereas a conical filter, if it's penetrated through, we've seen some um, we've seen some complications from other centers. Uh, actually, I just mentioned this yesterday that there was a patient that from the UK that had a filter that was reconstructed through and the filter component then perforated through into the duodenum. There was then continuity of the duodenum with the stent. The patient became septic and died. Mm. Um, so uh, if you can remove the offending device and the cable occlusions, I certainly strongly advocate it. We've written on that as well. Yeah. So this is uh, my case, um, a little bit unusual. 65-year-old female, history of multiple DVTs, primarily in her left leg. She has asymmetric enlargement of her left leg, lower extremity. Extensive venous stasis changes with skin damage, varicosities, and venous claudication. She's on indefinite uh, warfarin therapy. A retrieval filter was placed in late 2017 for perioperative mechanical prophylaxis before a knee replacement that was placed by a groin approach. At a retrieval attempt in early 2018, thrombus was noted above and below the filter, and a second suprarenal filter was placed on top of that. Uh, the referring operator attempted retrieval in 2021, and pornography at that time demonstrated a patent IVC, so that thrombus, that organized thrombus or whatever it was, is gone now, probably on anticoagulation, it was remodeled, but was unable to, uh, to retrieve that cranial filter, and so referred it to us. So I'll just go through this, and you can see there's one in the hepatic segment, and the second one down in the infrarenal segment. And also you can see that there's a post-thrombotic obstruction of the left uh, external and common iliac vein. You have that thin linear calcium, calcium that's going through. I'll let this pay, play through again, and there's a couple things to note here. And if I can pause it, maybe. Doesn't look like I'll be able to, but... The first one feels it appear it's certainly penetrated through, but it appears relatively well centered. But the second one is more problematic, and I wish I could pause this. Not I think we'll see this on my floral images. The second one looks like the apex is actually through the cable wall, so that's going to be a different approach. And I'd be curious to see how you'd approach this. But you need to get basically reposition that filter with it into back into the cava. And frequently what ends up happening is that you have to invert these devices, at least in our experience as well. So then the laser doesn't come into play. But with the top one, it's a long dwelling device. We know the laser is going to uh, play a role. So we know we're going to need multiple axes. The caudal filter with that apex projecting through the cable wall is not going to be readily accessible by the jugular approach. You might need adjunctive jugular uh, access to do something with fragments or whatever that may be left behind. But uh, your primary working sheet for that that uh, filter with the apex through the wall is going to be from the groin, and then you'll need the jugular axis for the cranial filter. Um, we prepare with the laser sheath and the, the laser box being in the room, as well as forceps being available to us, and this is going to be a, a, a complex procedure, so we're going to make sure that this patient is under general anesthesia to, to, so that we remove the element of sedating that patient and managing a sedated patient while we're doing such a procedure. So you can see that it's already fractured in this first image. There's that one uh, strut that's already pointing out, and that's from the caudal device that's uh, projecting through the wall. Um, here's an initial AP cavergram. Maybe maybe looks like it's inside, but again, as we know as radiologists, that one view is no view. So you have to try and find the view that's going to show you exactly where the apex lays. And this is in a steep oblique, and you can see very clearly that the hook is penetrating through the cable wall. So we're not going to be able to get this entirely from jugular axis. So with that filter fracture and tip projecting through the wall, we're, my position is you're going to need to invert and potentially either reposition the apex back into an intraluminal position that you can apply techniques, or what frequently happens is as you're trying to pull it through, the whole thing inverts from the groin. And I'm going to say that this is not something that should be taken upon lightly. I don't particularly enjoy inverting filters from the groin. It's, it's one of the scariest things that you have to do, but there really is very few other options for dealing with this apart from a major open surgery. So this is what we're doing. We can see I'm working in an oblique and very carefully pulling things down, trying to reposition it. And this device particularly is single piece laser cut nitinol. This is an option filter. And so I wouldn't clearly advocate doing a full inversion with devices that are welded or, or soldered together or whatever you want to call multiple pieces. Single piece laser cut nitinol, you can't do it. There are two devices that are single piece laser cut nitinol, option and Denali. 
the rest, um, I think I would be more uh, inclined to reposition the apex back into the into the cable in, into the cable lumen and then work from the, the the jugular approach. You'll see that we then use the jugular access to pull out the fractured fragments that you see here, and then I needed to use a different type of forceps, a, a duck bill, to help me get that final one. So the main thing here is that you remove every fragment because any any uh, remnant intraluminal fragments represents an embolization risk if you leave it behind. So you. If you, if you can't get it, then it's incumbent upon you to prove that it's not within the cable lumen anymore. That includes either doing multiple oblique uh, cablegrams or potentially called BMCT if that's available to you. So I wanted to specifically show this case because this is, you're, you can expect this to happen if you do enough of these cases. This is a contained cable rupture. We've seen this. This patient is completely asymptomatic. They may be in pain, but they're under general anesthesia, so we don't know that part. But completely stable, you have a contained extravasation of pseudoaneurysm. So this is when you need an occlusion balloon available to you in the room. And so we put up, we put up, uh, this is a, an excluder, uh, not an excluder, I forgot exactly the name, it's Boston Scientific's aortic occlusion balloon that we put up. You can use a coda, you can use this, uh, the bridge balloon, which of course it's off-label to use that for this purpose, but also would, uh, also would work well. And we just put it up for a few minutes, and then we repeat the run. And frequently in our, our, our experience, it's still there. Sometimes it gets a little bit smaller, but it's usually still there. But as long as it's not getting bigger, we feel relatively, uh, we feel relatively good about moving forward. We then go to the much more, frankly, mundane <laughs> uh, super, uh, super renal filter, and this came out within a matter of seconds with, uh, with the laser, as you can see right here. So this is the final, and you can see that there's this little bit of irregularity in that cava. We monitored this patient overnight. Nothing happened. No new lower extremity edema. There was no onset of DVT. She is anticoagulated, so we sent her home. She came back two months later. She was from out of town um, for an iliac vein recanalization. We performed the iliac vein recanalization, as you see here. And then we checked the cava, and it's actually, this is what we've seen in our experience, that it remodels and closes. And those we've had much, much larger pseudoaneurysms that in the low flow, and low pressure state of the vena cava, as long as it's contained, they remodel and, and close on their own because the laminar flows down the center of the, of the cable lumen and then the pseudoanders and closes. So I think with that, I thank you all for your attendance and we're obviously available for any questions you have. Just uh, wanted to repeat this gentleman's question for the record. <clears throat> I believe you were asking when do you actually open the laser sheath. Um, that's a great question. And probably another question to ask before that is when do you bring the laser generator itself into the room? And this is why we see our patients in clinic, and I'm, I'm sure Kush does the same. Um, after having enough experience and gathering enough data, <clears throat> you can predict uh, which cases are going to have a high probability, high likelihood that you're going to actually need the laser generator. And then you can even get down to what size laser sheath. And, you know, CavaClear is, is fortunately available in the two larger sizes. But the original system, there were actually three different sizes, 12, 14, and 16. As far as the protocol in the room, um, once we confirm that the, the filter is embedded, I think I, I tried to show that in, in these earlier slides, um, once we confirm that, hey, this is not coming out, with several pounds of tension, that's when we'll actually open it up, um, calibrate it. Uh, we actually have safety checks as well. Our hospital, we're required to do a laser timeout. Um, there's just some basic safety uh, steps that you have to take, uh, including um, eye protection, for example, and the way that the system is calibrated. 
Did that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. So right. you actually have the outer sheet already in place. So you can let go of it and then go back in and grab it. I see. Yeah. So you want to know um, in terms of letting go of the device um, and, and versus having to recapture. So uh, we've learned over, over the years how to maintain access. Uh, in other words, um, the snare itself can be used as a tracking wire, and especially for a, a, hook, a hook on a filter, um, you can use that to do the exchange and to advance a coaxial laser sheet system. Probably easier to, to talk about that in a hands-on workshop, which we're actually going to be on tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning over in the expo. And for human stasis, what are you using the actual um, device? Because I think, I mean, I've used it, and so there's a lot of blood coming back, and I usually just put a sheet in it. But yeah, okay, that's a wonderful question. Uh, this gentleman's asking all the right questions here. So he wants to know about hemostasis, because if you take a look at the apparatus as it exists now, there's no hemostatic valve on the back end, and that was an observation we made from the very beginning. And We've actually experimented with a variety of sheath combinations that can fit in there snugly to create the hemostatic valve. We can go over the specific specs uh, tomorrow morning in the uh, in the expo session. But yes, you, you I prefer to actually have a, a coaxial uh, smaller sheath in there. I'm not sure what uh, Dr. Sai uses, but what I typically do is um, the coax we we do use coaxial sheets, but if it's a looped wire, often you can't get it through the coaxial sheet. So in that case, you just have the room ready. What happens is as you get to the point of maximum cable collapse, the cable is collapsed so there's no blood return. And so then bleeding will, will cease and then you go through. But if it's just a snare, then in that case, yes, we use uh, we use something to operate the whole, you know, a French, whatever it may be. Um, one thing I, I will point out is we have the box in the room calibrated, ready to go. The disposable is not open. But the box is in the room and turned on, so we don't have a five-minute warm-up, at least with our current device that we have. Yeah, that's a good point. If you think you're going to be using the generator, uh, occasionally the tech will forget to turn it on and warm it up. And this is with the original CVX-300. Um, we're told that that's going to be phased out very soon. And uh, the newer system, I guess, warms up a lot faster. So you can so. calibrate it without getting the sheet? Yep. You have to calibrate the sheet itself, but you have to calibrate it with the calibration fiber separately. So you have to calibrate the box, and then you have to calibrate the actual sheet. Have you done a few cases? Yeah. Yeah. And how long have you been working on uh, on using the device? Probably maybe eight years. So. Okay, great. So uh, maybe you've come across some of some of our papers along the way that, that were helpful. Yes, extremely. Okay. Comments specifically directed at some of the more challenging anyways. So, um, to repeat the gentleman's question, you're asking about removing the Simon Nightnall filter. You want to? Yeah, sure. Talk about so, it? Um, actually, I think at, uh, at uh, yeah. the Venus Symposium, meet the experts for Phillips, I showed a Simon Nightnall that resulted in a nilio cable occlusion, much like Will's case, um, that we retrieved. Um, the challenge with Simon Nightnall is there's no hook, right? <laughs> so you're gonna. Sometimes the snare will hold it. Uh, sometimes it won't. It, it depends on actually how much tissue is on top of it. So there are a couple different devices. One of the devices I don't know if you've used this. I've used the Captus device actually with Simon Nightnall um, specifically because there isn't the, the the bushing at the top otherwise doesn't capture it. And the nice thing about the Avantech device, the Captus device, is you can actually slide the laser over it. So it's this Nightnall mesh funnel that then you ratchet closed around it. And it's got little teeth on the inside of it, <coughs> and then you can disconnect your your torque on the back and slide the laser over it, and then reconnect your torque, and that's your traction platform, which is what we did for Simon. That's what I've been doing for Simon Night now. Earlier on, before that device was available, it was often sometimes you get lucky and the snare works, um, but otherwise it would be a looped wire that you had that would be different than what I described in my initial talk. In that case, I actually would go through the filter, and you have to be very careful that you're dead center on it. It's a great question, and we've had uh, quite a bit of experience actually encountering that scenario, and we've learned uh, you know a great many things. So, 
The wire loop technique that Kush mentioned, which has been used and, and written up in multiple institutions, <clears throat> it, it comes in handy for that device. If you're able to weave through the umbrella, you can generate traction to try to collapse the umbrella first and then the legs. What we've seen is that as a whole spectrum of presentations with Simon Knight and all, um, from not much scar tissue where it's easily sheathed uh, with just several pounds of tension, all the way to um, needing laser, uh, in particular to ablate the tissue that accumulates along the umbrella, part of that, the cone. Um, but we've also seen cases where there's dense calcified thrombus within it, which is um, <coughs> where we're unable to remove the device. So, um, and it bears reminding the audience too, as I said in the earlier talk, um, that's as a, as a permanent filter, right? So it's not actually FDA cleared for removal. So just keep that in mind too. Retrievals have been previous attempts, whether by vascular surgery or cardiology, and they're often fragile and the fractures can move distally. When they do move into the uh, atrium or pulmonary circuit, how often are you able to successfully retrieve those fragments without inducing disarrhythmia? Yeah, so that's a great question. I want to know exactly what I'm dealing with, and that's the purpose of the clinic visit because that's all, there's counseling involved with this. You have a device, or this patient has a device that the integrity has been compromised. There's a risk that even with the best technique that you'll have migration and embolization of fragments. So we talk about all that up front, that you might need X, Y, and Z. And these are the risks associated with it. The difference is, of course, with the fracture fragment that's in situ, if it occurs on the table, I watched it happen, and I can manage it. If you're sitting at home on the couch watching TV, it might happen, and you don't know until it's too late. So that's one of the distinctions we make. Specifically with regards to removing fragments, fresh fragments that go into the pulmonary artery, relatively straightforward to retrieve. That um, typically just a, a long sheath with shuttle and then you know a snare and you can take it out. Um, intracardiac fragments, people have had have had some success. I know you've published your result the results and the pen group has published the results. I think it's roughly around 60%, maybe lower. I don't know. It's not it's not anywhere near the success rates that we get for filters and for, for filter retrieval itself. And what I would point out is that in a beating heart, three-dimensional structure, you have to be really careful. Papillary muscles, cordy, all sorts of things. You can get tangled. Patients frequently become uh, develop arrhythmias on the table. And if, I, if in, in the one case where I've had a fragment migrate to the heart and I couldn't get it out, um, that patient, it ended up lodging into the tricuspid valve was within a millimeter or two of the right coronary artery. It was a young patient, that, and this was actually not even a laser case. Um, it, was a, it was a fractured open cell filter. Um, we, the cardiac surgeon took it out. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and it's one of the most feared complications of these devices. That they can fracture and, and parts can embolize into the cardiopulmonary circulation. When we analyze about half a decade's worth of data on the outcomes of fractured fragments, uh, we actually came to the conclusion that most of them can be removed as long as they're intraluminal and they're in the proximal portions of the pulmonary vasculature. But when it came to the cardiac subset, um, the retrieval success was only about half or 50 to 60 percent, as Kush uh, mentioned. And so um, that is probably uh, one of the, the ultimate frontiers in terms of what's capable to do and you know, what is that risk to benefit ratio? Um, we've learned over time too that there are certain fragments incidentally discovered in cardiac structures that can actually be left in safely, um, but it, the onus is on us to prove that it's been stable over time. And so we turn to uh, cardiac gated CT scans and, and monitoring to reassure ourselves and the patient that this fragment is, isn't going anywhere. Um, now, conversely, we've seen uh, the opposite. We've seen fragments that, uh, for whatever reason, decided they were going to land orthogonally against the RV free wall and, and perforate through and cause a hemopericardium, and it becomes a surgical emergency. Um, there have been a handful of cases like that. We were able to spare the patient from open cardiothoracic surgery uh, by de decompressing with a pericardial drain, the hemopericardium, and then very carefully and very gently removing the, the fragment from the free wall. So there's a whole spectrum of, of presentations, and, and as Kush has alluded to, um, oftentimes there's multidisciplinary involvement, and there's consultations, 
Uh, we've had cases where we simply weren't able to get the uh, fragments out and they had hemopericardium with chest pain and they had to have cardiothoracic surgery uh, as the end result. Um, but we've also seen entire filters embolize. Uh, and some of these um, more recently were embolized um, that was caused by the actual failed retrieval attempt. So we've seen cases where the filter itself, uh, they attempted to remove it, but they were never able to secure the apex. And the, you know, the whole device ended up embolizing and the patients had to be airlifted to our center and we had cardiothoracic surgery on standby and we made attempts to remove the device percutaneously as a first step. So these things can spiral you know, out uh, pretty, pretty quickly and you just have to be, be ready. They're getting, they frequently have CT scans. I mean, you can't really go to the ED nowadays without getting a CT scan. Um, so they frequently have CT scans, and at least our personal approach is if it's a long end wall device and there's been a CT within the last 12 months, I don't personally subject them to another. Um, but if they haven't had one, then yes, we want to know what we're starting with before we move forward. Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, I think for, for our centers, you know, we actually take referrals from all over. That means that either the patient's failed removal, uh, sometimes multiple times, or the case has been deemed too complex to even attempt the removal. And so it's pretty mandatory that we're going to have a CT scan that's been done at least within the last several months to a year, depending on the filter type and the complexity of the presentation. You can make diagnoses, too, of other pathology that's related to the filter. Uh, that may not be so obvious, especially with a prolonged filter implant. Um, you, can, you can detect occlusions and fractured pieces that oftentimes were the first to tell the patient that the filter was broken. They never knew that. Um, but it's really important to have radiographic imaging, um, at least on a fundamental level, to identify the actual filter type. Some of these cases are coming to us um, after longer and longer dwell times. And, and sometimes there are filters that are no longer being made. And so you have to identify the device and then come up with the plan based off that. All right, thanks everyone. Um, and yes, actually, please do come to, if you can, to the hands-on workshop and we'll both be there uh, with the models and other devices as well. Thank you.